Thank you, Klaus, and uh, thanks to all of the, the Munich C++ meetup team, um, and, and for team for doing an excellent talk. Just, just a warm-up for, for my talk, of course. <laughs> uh, actually, there, there's a little bit of overlap in some of the topics, surprisingly enough, so uh, maybe we'll, we'll touch on that. Well, So um, I'm sure many of you uh, know me from either previous talks to this meetup or, or other conferences, but uh, you may not have noticed until two more. Um, stole my thunder and <laughs> mentioned it, that I, I have a new job uh, as of uh, this June. I'm now working at Sonosource instead of JetBrains. Um, there's actually a link in with this material because this material is, is mostly about the software quality. And Sonosource, we, we do static analysis tools, so it sort of fits into my interest in, in software quality. Uh, that will play a minor role in, in this material, but it's not really about that. So what is it about? So the title is Zen and the Art of Code Lifecycle Maintenance. Uh, you, you may recognize that from the title of a well-known book, which I've tried to reproduce the cover of here without uh, violating any, any copyrights. Uh, hopefully I've, I've done a good job of that. But what, where does this all come from? Well, taking a step back, as I mentioned, I do a lot of talks at, at conferences and, and other meetups. And in fact, I, I keep track of them on my website. And I was having a look at it recently and I noticed that since 2017, uh, sorry, 2015, and I hope you're catching all of this, uh, I have done 119 talks, which is way too many. Um, but as I'm looking through, I mean, obviously I, I did repeat some of those talks many times, but I, I noticed that you can actually group them into four sort of main areas that, uh, that come up a lot. So testing is an obvious one. If you know me, um, you, know, you, know, you know I talk about testing and TDD a lot. Functional programming, done uh, done a couple of talks on that. Well, the one directly was actually probably my longest running talk so far. This one might be um, the candidate for beating it. And uh, error handling, done two major talks on that. Uh, obviously, again, a few times uh, fairly recently. And just one talk on simplicity. But the material from that talk seems to crop up again and again in, in many of my other talks. Probably the, the talk that I go back to to reuse material from the most. And this is going to be no exception. Uh, well, we'll see why when I get to that, that part. But even within those four core areas, I did notice that there was a common thread, something that unified all of them, and that is that topic that I mentioned, software quality. They're all in some way about software quality. So that's raised a question. You know, what is software quality? This is going to be a talk about software quality, so we should actually get straight what we actually mean by it, because it turns out, there's a little bit of uh, controversy over that. And to illustrate what I mean, I want to quote from a, a blog that I, I sometimes follow, Shape of Code, uh, Derek Jones. He's, uh, he's actually the author of a, a book on evidence-based software engineering. So we often have some, some interesting insights. Now this uh, post from uh, back in March, I think, the aura of software quality. So he's talking about the right subject. And he has this to say. Now, first of all, I really like this turn of phrase. He says that uh, people in industry are very interested in software quality, and sometimes they have the confusing experience of talking to me about it. Hmm. Okay, interesting way of wording it. Now, a little bit further down, he states it very clearly. Software quality, he says, is a meaningless marketing term. Huh, okay. Now, he doesn't mean, I'm pretty sure, uh, if you read the rest of the post that supports this, that Software quality itself is worthless. It's the term that he has the problem with because everyone has their own definition of what it actually means. So if you're talking about software quality with somebody else, they may be talking about a different thing. And that's the root of the problem. You know, what is software quality? Well, we all have our own definitions. So of course we do have this cartoon to fall back on. Everyone knows this one. The only valid measurement of code quality, WTS per minute. And the reason this is funny is it resonates with us. We can relate to this. There's an idea here that nobody can actually define what software quality or code quality is, but we know it when we see it. That, that's really the essence of this. Now, that's interesting because that, that ties in to the book that the title of this talk is based on. So you probably recognize Zen and the Art of Motorcycle Maintenance. Inquiry into Values is the subtitle, Robert Piercig. So... If you haven't read this book, by the way, you absolutely should. Um, and, and also the follow-up book, which is uh, less well-known, Lila, which I think is actually the better book. 
Uh, not so many people have read that. And the, the whole point of this book, I mean, it won't go into a complete uh, a summary of the book, but it um, takes place on a sort of a road trip. It, it's a narrative, but really it's about, it's about uh, philosophy and uh, particularly that the central theme is quality and trying to define quality. Sounds familiar? Now, uh, Piercy actually goes as far as saying that quality is undefinable. You can't actually define it, but everyone knows it when they see it. Just what we've been, been talking about. What he does instead is he like, divides the world into two, two types of quality. What he calls classical quality versus romantic quality. Where classical quality is really about how things work. So that engineering mindset. Whereas the romantic quality is how things look or how they're used. That sort of more you know, design-oriented thinking. So, you know, we, we can get something from that, that uh, both in general, but also in terms of uh, software quality. That's, that's one way to break things down. Interestingly, that follow-up book, the less well-known one, Lila, he actually spits it a different way. He divides uh, static quality and dynamic quality. And there's a couple of terms that we're used to, to dealing with in, in software development. It's talking about something slightly different, of course. Uh, so dynamic quality is when something sort of happens in the moment. That sort of leading edge of reality, he calls it. Uh, he uses the example of the first time you may, may be hearing your song. And you can appreciate the quality of that song the first time you hear it. But once you've heard it many, many times, you might still have an appreciation of its now static quality, but it doesn't have the same meaning to you. You don't connect to it in the same way, because now you're just, you're just used to it, so it's become static. And there's many different ways that plays out, but we're getting a little bit off topic. The, um, the, the main point here is that there, there is a connection in this book in the way that we can't define quality, uh, but we can say some things about it. Now, that doesn't stop people trying to define it. So there's a whole Wikipedia page on software quality. And uh, I've just cherry picked a few definitions. There's actually uh, quite a lot more there if you want to go and see it. But most of these definitions really are talking about um, the, how your software actually applies to the problem at hand. You know, so how, how well it actually achieves what you set out to do, rather than the internal qualities that uh, we, we might normally be, be thinking of. And as I'm surprised, most of these quotes are from sort of systems thinkers or, or systems theorists. Uh, for example, um, uh, Jerry Weinberg, there, there just towards the end, uh, he says that uh, quality is value to some person. So first of all, there's that value word. Remember the, uh, the, the book was inquiring into values. But I like the sort of the just vague enough uh, quality uh, of this. You know, it's value to some person. doesn't matter what the value is or who the person is. If it's providing that value, then it has some quality. And, you know, you can maximise the value and so on. But, but that's a nice way of looking at it. But it's, it's not really the type of quality that we're normally thinking of when we talk about software quality as developers. Now, it, it would be nice, given that everyone does have their own definition of quality, if there's some sort of standard for this. Somebody actually sat down and said, right, here's what everyone should mean, and just write it down. Funnily enough, there, there is an attempt to do this. There's the Consortium for Information and Software Quality, CISQ. Uh, everyone's heard of this, I'm sure. Oh, maybe, maybe you have. I, I hadn't. <laughs> um, but it talks about, well, it actually talks about um, two or three, depending on how you count it, different types of quality. Um, there's a sort of a more external kind, which is more like that system theorist type that we were just talking about, and how it applies to, to a particular task. But then there's also what it calls structural quality, and that's really these internal qualities that, uh, that we're, we're generally more interested in. There seems to be a little bit of a, a, a glitch in my font rendering there. Uh, the quality of keynote, I think, in this case. But here, here's a quote. So structural quality refers to the software's security, reliability, performance efficiency, and maintainability. Great, now we've got a list. We can, we can work with that. That's actually split that out a bit. Security, reliability, performance efficiency, and maintainability. They sound like quite reasonable things to, to think about. Okay, now before I came across this, I was working on my own set of, of uh, qualities, sub-qualities if you like. And uh, most of them, I think, correspond reasonably well with that list. Maybe the most divergent is the first one. So I've got correctness, 
instead of security. There's clearly a relation there, but they're different things. Now, I'm not a security or code security expert, so I'm going to stick just with, with correctness. Uh, that will get you a long way, but not all the way there. But security is certainly uh, important. Reliability, well, full marks there, I think. Now, amusingly, um, they have performance efficiency. I had performance slash efficiency, like you know, two sides to the same thing. And uh, for maintainability, I had the choice of uh, malleability or evolvability. You know, how easy it is to, to change things and therefore how easily they can change over time was the, the point there. But I also had uh, an extra one, which was reasonability. Uh, and maybe this drops out of maintainability, but I think it's worth mentioning this in its own right. Yeah, how easy is it for your code to be reasoned about? We might think of it as being how readable your code is. I think it's a little bit more than that. It's a little bit more abstract. How easy is it to reason about it? We'll, we'll talk a bit about that later. Uh, so I had that one extra one. And also another extra one, which was that, that um, more sort of external quality, the systems theorist view of how applicable your, your software is to the task at hand. Uh, again, CISQ had that accounted for elsewhere. So I'll give them that one. So I'm going to stick with, with my list. Being satisfied that it matches up pretty well with uh, the CISQ list. Now, whenever you have a list of things that you want to treat as a whole, very tempting to try to get some sort of acronym out of the first letters. And, uh, you know, I, I'm not immune to this. So I had a go. Unfortunately, the best I could come up with was Mr. Crap, which wasn't particularly compelling. So um, I thought, ah, how can I do better? Now, fortunately, because I do have those two alternates, the malleability, evolvability, performance efficiency. Uh, what if we go with those second words instead? Let's give that a try. And sure enough, we can get career out of that. Great, that's a good career move. Now, I, I never thought of myself as a, uh, a career programmer. Maybe now is a good time to think about that. So, okay, lighthearted, but it can actually be useful to you know, pull out an acronym and, and say, right, the set of principles or qualities or whatever are represented by this word. Because now you've got something to you know, hang things on, uh, easy to remember. So let's go with career. But more importantly, we have this, this list of qualities. And we could easily do a, a talk or multiple talks on each one of these individually. Many people have, uh, including myself. As we said, I've done lots of talks in, in this area already. We, well, I'm not going to revisit those now uh, in depth. What I'm more interested in and where this talk is really coming from is actually the intersection between some of these. So I find that really interesting because where these things intersect, there's either trade-offs where you have to trade one quality off against another. Or sometimes they work together uh, in, in maybe unexpected ways. So that's really what we're going to do. So to get, get us started, I'm going to look at the first two. The intersection between applicability, how good something is at the, the, the task uh, intended, and correctness, which is generally either you know, how bug-free something is or just how well you're applying best practice. So we might think of this as applicability is doing the right thing versus correctness doing the thing right. And if that sounds familiar, it, it's something you, you may have heard before, and it usually traces back to this quote from Russell Ackoff, another one of those systems theorists. He says, it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. And, you know, the thing about this sort of resonates, you know, if you, if you do the, the wrong thing right, you might actually go too far down the wrong path. Whereas if you're doing the right thing wrong, maybe uh, you, can, you can change course and, and do it better. Now, there's a full quote here, just to give it a bit more context, that, uh, that has a little bit more, more flesh. The righter we do the wrong thing, the wronger we become. When we make a mistake doing the wrong thing and correct it, we become wronger. When we make a mistake doing the right thing and correct it, we become righter. Therefore, and then the quote, it's better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. It all sounds really reasonable. And people have taken this and applied it to, to software development and nobody's really questioned it. Well, they have, we'll get to that. But before we get to that, I actually want to continue the quote that the bit that is almost never mentioned, which I think really sets the context 
he actually carries on. This is very significant because almost every problem confronting our society is a result of the fact that our public policymakers are doing the wrong things and are trying to do them righter. As I said, Akhoff was a systems theorist. He wasn't talking about software at all. And this makes it clear, he was actually talking about society and public policymakers and politicians. Quite far removed from software development. And in fact, there are aspects of software development that may actually make this a bit different. I think we should explore those. In fact, I'm not the first person to ask this question. Uh, so Alan Kelly, who um, is more in the, the agile world, uh, he did a talk a few years ago that was a bit of an eye-opener uh, called uh, Do It Right and Then Do The Right Thing. So I don't know if you noticed those, um, the, the blue and green bubbles at the top. We, we swapped them over when I brought that slide up. We're, we're reversing the order here. So I would encourage you to go and watch this talk because uh, it, it's really fascinating. I'm just going to highlight some, some bits from it. He talks about what he calls the alignment trap. Now, this is based on, based on a, a study. There's some real numbers that you can go back and, and look at. He's uh, summarized it in this uh, quadrant diagram. So you've got doing the right things along the bottom versus doing the right thing. Sorry, doing things right along the bottom versus doing the right thing uh, on, the, on the left. So four quadrants. Now, he's talking about companies here, businesses, in terms of their IT spending. So it's particularly the, the uh, IT or software development part of this, and uh, sales and, and growth, or sales growth. So um, obviously everyone who want, wants to be in that yellow quadrant at the top, the uh, IT-enabled growth, where we've got low spending, high sales growth. Uh, great, that, that's where you want to be. Only 7% of companies are up there, according to these figures. Most companies, of course, are down at the bottom left the maintenance zone, average IT spending, uh, very low sales growth. Maybe not surprising. You know, maybe we've worked for some of those companies. It is 74% of them, after all. That's not the interesting part, though. The interesting part is those other two quadrants. You've got the alignment trap, where the slide gets its name from, which is high spending, and mediocre sales. And then well old IT in the, the bottom right, where you've got sort of average spending, no, uh, sorry, low spending, but reasonably good sales. So that's actually already a much better place to be in, given those figures. This is the case of companies that are more effective, they're doing things right, but just that they're not doing the right things yet. They're not aligned to the business objectives. Whereas the alignment trap is, is the other way around. So Akoff would have us in that blue quadrant if we're not in the yellow one. The other point that, uh, that Adam makes is that if you're in that green quadrant, the, the well old IT, it's actually easier to move from there into the yellow quadrant. You get trapped. In the, in the blue quadrant, quadrant, that's where the name comes from. So software development is a bit different because it is easier to change things if you're doing them right. Whereas outside of software, that may not be the case. So that, that's, I found that really fascinating and instructive that um, yeah, doing the right thing may actually be more important than, sorry, doing things right may actually be more important than doing the right thing initially. He, he then goes on to make the point that actually we often have to iterate before we find out what the right thing is in the first place. Have a few stabs at it and we, we gradually get there. But uh, yeah, go and watch the talk. That's uh, definitely worth a watch. So coming back to our stack, before I move on, this is a good point to uh, check to see if anyone has any questions yet. Uh, have there been any questions so far? There's been no questions so far, but uh, I think people are still fascinated by Mr. Crab. <laughs> That's usually where they get stuck, unfortunately. <laughs> there, there is more to this talk than that. <laughs> All right, let's carry on. <laughs> Try and prove my point. All right. So the next pairing I want to look at uh, is correctness again, but this time with reliability. So now, again, with correctness here, we're talking more about being bug-free, no, no logic errors, that sort of thing. Versus reliability is actually more about handling unexpected cases. So 
we typically uh, associate this with error handling. Uh, there's more to it, but that's what we're going to focus on here. So putting those two things together is mostly about coverage, because we're going to assume if you want correctness, you've got a good, uh, good set of tests, but how well do your tests cover your code? So that's, that's the, uh, the area of code coverage. Now we know about code coverage. You, you may have used code coverage tools. Uh, you've surely at least heard of it. But most code coverage tools are dealing with either line or statement coverage. So slightly different, but basically the same sort of thing. You know, did, was this line or statement actually hit while running the tests? Great. It's a useful metric, especially if you're working with legacy code and you're trying to increase the coverage. If you're already starting out by doing TDD, um, in theory, you should actually end up with 100% code coverage automatically, just by the nature of TDD. So using a tool to, to verify that, that can be useful, but can also give you a false sense of security. Because just because you've got 100% line or statement coverage doesn't mean that all of the code itself, all of the paths through it are covered. So really we want to have the path or data coverage as well. So as I said, line of statement coverage is the domain of unit testing and, and TDD, but data coverage, how can, we, how can we tackle that? So as far as I know, as far as I've been able to find and reason about, it's pretty much impossible to actually measure your data or branch coverage uh, in any sort of non-trivial application. But there are techniques for increasing our coverage and giving us confidence. Uh, property number one is property-based testing. So if you've done unit testing, particularly in the context of TDD, you'll be familiar with that sort of more example-based testing. We say, well, given these input values, I expect this to happen. And then you test that it does. Which works great when you're just probing at the, the, the what I call the contours of your design, the bits you already know about in advance. We expect this to happen. You've got some values for it. But it doesn't get to those unexpected paths particularly the error paths that you may not have considered. Property-based property testing is mostly based on random, generating random numbers to probe uh, a much bigger area of your, your domain, including those values that you hadn't thought of. And then rather than testing specific examples, you're testing properties that always hold. It's a little bit more tricky to, to get your mind into. Uh, you're a little bit more limited in what you can do, but actually, once you start practicing, you can actually uh, get some surprising good properties. It's not just limited to the more sort of mathematical code, as some people might think when they first see it. So this is not a talk about property-based testing. I'm introducing the, the subject for those that are less familiar to, to go and have a look at it. I do encourage you to, to look at property-based testing if you haven't done so already. There's a lot more to it than that but it's a great way to increase your, your confidence in your data or branch coverage. Now related to that, but at a bit of a high level is fuzz testing. So this is say generally at a high level, maybe even um, sort of from outside your, your application, uh, instrumenting it. Uh, again, using random inputs, but often more tuned to sort of known problematic values. Uh, I'm less of an expert on that. so. I'm just throwing it in there as something else to look at. And finally, don't forget manual testing. Yes, we want to automate as much as we can. Definitely all the example-based unit tests, property-based testing, if you can do that, fast testing, automate it all, absolutely. But manual testing is when you get a person whose mindset is just to break things. Can't beat that for finding things that you hadn't thought of. So if you have the opportunity to work with a human manual tester, then take that opportunity that will definitely find things that you, uh, you didn't think were possible. So that is my formula for how to maximize your, your coverage and therefore your, your reliability along with your correctness. Now I mentioned error paths in there a few times and I think it's worth talking about that a little bit more in its own right. Now there's, there's two types of error paths that I wanna talk about. The, the first type, are what I call IO errors. Some people call them disappointments. So these are the things that we'll typically use 
error codes, error returns, exceptions, uh, anything like that for. They are things that you can predict may happen. You don't want them to happen, but you think, well, if that happens, I'll take this different path. You may just be disappointed, but you can, you can cope with it. Contrast that with logic errors, which is more the domain of contracts. And when I say contracts here, I'm not specifically thinking of the, the feature that got pulled out of C++20. It'd be nice if we get that back at some point. We're, we're working on it. Don't know when it's going to arrive yet. But you can achieve the same thing with, or similar, with just assertions or a third-party library, or even just in, in comments, you can state what your contract is. There's always a contract there. It's just whether you, you enforce it or not. The point here is that violation of these is not something that you expect. Uh, you, you expect it to be within your contract. And if you're not, then it's a bug. Logic error is a bug. So throwing an exception in this case is almost always the wrong thing to do, which is uh, interesting because we have a std logic error. Uh, it's been said that std logic error is itself a logic error. Uh, you shouldn't, shouldn't throw that, but, but, but we have it. So it's, it's very important to, to separate these things. Now, there may be some um, debate over what things exactly constitute an IO error versus logic error sometimes, but knowing that there are these two different things that you need to handle differently and all the trade-offs is, is really important. And something that we're only really starting to get to know in the, in the mainstream these days. Uh, it's been mixed up a lot in the past, hence logic error being in an exception in the standard library. Let's dig into this a little bit more. So here's an example of some code where we're going to uh, just convert a string to an integer. Not a particularly exciting implementation, just using a string stream, that's not important. But what happens if you call this with a string that is not an integer? Well, I would expect to get a zero after that. And my reading of the, the standard is that that should be guaranteed because it's trying to convert characters to integers until it finds the first non-integer, which will be the first character. So ends up with a zero. Uh, it's actually a little bit buried in the standard how that works. But, but there's a problem there because now we can't distinguish that zero from an actual zero in the string. There's nothing saying that that's an error. So of course, we can, we can check the stream is good. And, uh, and if it's not, we can do something else, like throw an exception. Okay, so now we're converting that to a, uh, an IO error. Um, now you, you might think that an exception is not a good way to deal with this particular case, because maybe you want to just sort of speculatively test, you know, is this actually, does this string contain an integer? If so, what is it? But otherwise, I'm going to do something else. So a still optional may be a better bet here. Now you can do it with with control flow. So not going to labor this too much, we're fairly familiar with stud optional now, but we know that it has pointer-like semantics, so you can test it for you know, truly, and you can do reference to value if it is a, a set optional. So nothing terribly surprising about this code once you're familiar with it. But there's still a problem here, and that is that you can dereference that value without having to check. It's only by convention that you check it first, which is sort of fine, but you could, you could easily dereference it somewhere else. And uh, unfortunately, that's undefined behavior in C++ if you do that. So what can we do instead? Well, C++23 is going to have the so-called monadic operations on, uh, on std optional. So a map. Um, Forget the middle one now, and uh, or else. So uh, I think it's uh, and then, isn't it? In this case, we're just using map or or else. So this does exactly the same as the the previous example. So map is just taking the dereferenced integer and giving that to you as in a lambda. So you never have to dereference it yourself. If you're given it, then it's valid. Otherwise, it's going to drop into the or else block. And the, the and then is for sequencing another optional uh, onto that afterwards. Um, that's actually safer and simpler code once you get used to the slightly different syntax. Unfortunately, C++ Lambda syntax does get in the way a bit, but it's not too bad. So I'm glad this has gone into C++ 23.
Of course, you can still capture the optional and dereference it without checking. You know, that's the problem with C++. We never remove stuff from the standard, but um, I'm, I'm glad that feature's going in. So there's a few ways that we can deal with, with disappointments. Uh, we mentioned most of them now, exceptions, optional. There's good old error codes, of course. If you do use error codes or any sort of error return, do consider using no discard with that now. Uh, one of the problems with error codes is they're easily ignorable. And if you do use error codes, maybe consider using std error code to wrap them. Very useful type that's been in the standard since C++ 11, but not familiar to most people still. There's also boost outcome, which is, you can think of it as somewhere between exceptions and uh, error codes. Uh, that's another talk, but uh, something to look at. And in the future, uh, well, I talked about um, the, the magnetic operations on std optional. It looks like we're probably gonna get std expected, which works uh, similarly to optional, but in the error case, you get an additional value that tells you, or well, can tell you why you can get the value. So it can take, take over more of, um, of what you would have used exceptions for before maybe. Possibly, and, and Tim mentioned this in his talk, we may get P0709 so-called static exceptions at some point. Looking less likely at this point, but um, I'm still holding out hope. See my uh, other talks on, on that whole story. I won't dig into it again now. So these are all examples of IO errors or disappointments. So what about the, the logic errors or contracts then? Let's have a look at another example. This time sort of going the other way, converting an int to a string, but specifically this, stri uh, this integer represents a month number and we want to convert it to the name of a month. Okay, right now, this function has a range, which is the, the range of the integer, which can be between minus two billion and plus two billion, roughly. Uh, you can pass any of those in. It also has a domain. These are the values for which the function is actually valid, which is probably just between one and 12. There's a very big difference between the range and, and the domain. That we assume is one and 12, it could be zero and 11, though so you'll have to uh, document that somewhere as well, but that's not the purpose of this. The point is, there are values that you can pass in for which this function is not valid. And most of the time, or much of the time, that's what where we're talking about when we talk about a contract. Uh, but there are other, other things, of course. So inside, what can we do about it? Well, we could do what we did before. We could treat it as an IO error and throw an exception or maybe have some alternate return type and handle it that way. But that's probably not what we want to do. Because if you already know that your integer is definitely a valid month number, you don't want to pay for that check every time. So that, that, that's one thing. There could be a performance cost. We don't want to pay for what we don't, don't need. The other side to this is it may actually hide the error. If it's a logic error for you to pass in a, an integer that's not a valid month number, then throwing an exception or we're still returning something that, that may be ignored may actually uh, suppress or hide the error or it shows up in the wrong place. See, it may actually leave bugs longer in your code, depending on how it's, how it's written. So either way, this is not the best way to, to deal with this. So instead, we could, we could put an assert in there. And one day, maybe we can put a fully-fledged contract precondition in there. We won't dig into that too much now. But the point here is that if this fails, it's going to abort the runtime. Unless you're building an optimized build that has end debug, and therefore that's going to get compiled out, you won't do the check at all. So. Ideally, you have got your bugs out by then. We know this story. I'm not going to dwell on it too much. But there is a problem here because, well, now the validity of that contract or the, uh, how you validate that integer, the code for that is written inside the function. So if you have unvalidated data you want to pass into it, you've got to effectively duplicate that code outside and get it right might be trivial in this case, but in many cases it, it may not be. Well, okay, we, we have a, a way of deduplicating code like that. We can 
split it out into a helper function. Is valid month. Does the same thing, we can put that in the assert. And if we have unvalidated input, we can we can call that first before we call onto our month and string. Great. Now we're only paying for that check when we need it. For many people who argue for this style, that, that's enough. That, that's all you need to do. Uh, and that may be fine. But for me, that's not quite enough because I often find when I'm writing this sort of code in, in general, that there, there are many cases where I want to check before I construct. Many cases where I want to treat it as a potential IO error, where I have unvalidated data. Now, I do want to make that choice externally, so that, that part's good. So what we can do, of course, is maybe wrap that in another function. Let's call this one month of string checked. Does the check, throws an exception or whatever, and then we'll carry on and call the, um, the month of string that has the assert in. Okay, that's fine. Now we've got two functions. We know we have to call month of string checked if we have unvalidated data, or just month of string if we, we know for sure that it has a month number. Again, for, for many people, that's fine. I often prefer to do that the other way around and have the, the one that doesn't check or only has a, an assert or a contract as an unchecked version or, or whatever your naming convention is. And so effectively, the default way has the runtime check. So if you weren't thinking too much about it and you just pass something in without distinguishing between the two, you'll get the runtime check. And otherwise, you'll get the one that exposes you to the undefined behavior. Different people have different appetites. There's different schools of thinking of this. That often works for me. But there is more. So this all comes up because, in this particular case at least, we are providing an integer, which has that big range, for something that has a small, uh, small domain. And we can't really express that in the language. If we had a language like Ada, for example, and here's an example from the Wikipedia page for Ada, it actually gives the example of a date type. You can see their month type is range one to 12, built into the language, checked integers, great. Now, by the time you actually construct the date, you know that your month is in range. There may be other problems, but you know that one's okay. Of course, we can do that in C++. There are bounded integer libraries. We could use those. That may be uh, quite valid. We can also do it in a slightly more specific way, and there are advantages to this as well. Very simplified example for the sake of the slide. You could do something a little bit more sophisticated, but we'll just introduce a new type, a strong type def, if you like, for um, per month. So it contains our integer. You can get at it, in this case with get method. But you can see here our constructor is doing that check. So we've got the runtime check. If we construct one of these months with an integer that's not a month, then it throws an exception. So we're sort of just pushing that problem back to our month constructor. But it does mean that our month for string function can now be written in terms of that. We don't have to do any checks in there. We can assume that our contract is, is valid because of the type system. Okay, but what if I want to uh, construct one of these months with an integer that I still definitely know is a valid month. I will still want to do that sometimes. Well, we, we can't really overload the constructor. Uh, sorry, we can't give the constructor a different name, like the unchecked one, as we did before. So we can use a, an overloading technique. In this case, just using a tag type. Probably seen this sort of approach before. So just a, a, an empty type, uh, in this case, unchecked tag. The sole purpose is to allow you to overload the constructor. So you would call it just by passing in a default constructed version of that type. Compiler should optimize it out, should be no overhead. And now we can, we can construct an unchecked one that does the assertion, or the checked one that checks and throws the exception. And we can choose which one that we want depending on our needs, whether we, we have unvalid data data or not. Again, you can still make the choice whether you want the default, the one that doesn't require the tag, to be the checked or the unchecked version, 
that's still going to depend, depend on your exact needs, but I think this shifts the, the shifts at the favor in in favor of making the the checked version the default even more because because we're pushing this back as close as possible to our boundaries. And our boundaries are very often going to be our actual IO coming in from the user or a file or the network, or whatever. We'll check there and only there. And from that point on, we'll rely on the type system to enforce our contracts all the way through. If we know we've got a, month, uh, a valid month number, it's probably because we are constructing it from, a say, a literal. That's when you'd use the unchecked tag. And, and I think that's the right way around. But again, I'm interested to hear if um, people have a, a different opinion on that. So I don't know if you noticed there, but our bubbles at the top, we, uh, we introduced another bubble, the efficiency bubble. There, we've actually got the intersection of three, three parts here because now we have the opportunity to avoid that extra check, use the type system to, to enforce our contract and do less work so we could be more efficient. So an interesting intersection there. Okay, I've dwelt a little bit long on the whole error handling topic because it's, this was my, my deep dive. We're gonna go back to our bubbles and before I carry on, We'll see if there's any questions on that section. So there wasn't any question, but the remark that it does sound a lot like std vector add. Yeah, where you also make the choice um, that add throws, the subscript operator yeah. does not. Uh, that, that is true. And the, the, the problem is when you have lots of different ad hoc approaches to distinguish, distinguishing between the two, it can be difficult to remember which is which or whether you have the choice. So if you have the, the chance in your own code to establish a convention, like with the, the checked or the unchecked, uh, whatever that convention is, then I, th I think it's worth standardizing on that just to, uh, to make that a bit more regular. Uh, we, we can't change the, uh, the standard library. Um, what well, we can, but <laughs> yeah. Okay, so let's look at our next intersection. This is reasonability and evolvability. So reasonability, as I said, how easy it is to read or reason about your code and understand it. Whereas evolvability is how easy it is to change over time. So this is, I find, generally the domain of simplicity. As I said, I've done a whole other talk on that. But I also find that that usually implies functional programming techniques in practice. In particular, immutability by default and use of correct by construction techniques, which is similar to what we've just been talking about. So the month was correct by construction because once you've constructed it, you know it's correct. It's either thrown or, or aborted. That there's other correct by construction techniques you can use. Combination of those two, and sometimes a few other things from functional programming, will go a long way to making your code simpler which implies easier to reason about and easier to change. Let's dig into why a little bit more. So I'm gonna borrow some slides from that some talk on simplicity, uh, which I actually borrowed from a talk by Rich Hickey, or at least the illustrations. So Rich Hickey's talk, Simple Made Easy, is another one worth watching. And uh, what Rich uh, did was he, he delved into the, uh, the Latin roots of the words simple and complex. So a complex, in Latin is something with many folds or braids, as you can see in the illustration. Whereas a simplex, where we get the modern English word simple from, literally means something with one fold or braid. And I think the, the illustrations are, are really valuable here because if you look on the, the left-hand side, if you try to follow one of those strands from the bottom to the top, it's, it's trivial. You have no tr trouble knowing exactly where it ends up. You don't even have to follow it. But that's not the case on the right hand side. If you follow one of those strands from the top, from the bottom to the top, you've got to carefully trace it all the way up. And there's only four strands. So it's an illustration of how quickly complexity, which is the, the folding over or intersecting of, of things, destroys your ability to 
Just look at something and understand it in its entirety. So what does this actually mean for our code? So here are some things that increase complexity according to this definition. Some of these not surprising, you know, threading and concurrency, of course. Globals, singletons, or any sort of uh, shared state is going to uh, complect different parts of, of your code. Uh, mutability is an interesting one. How does that actually cause some sort of crossing over? Well, the things that they're crossing over here are a, an object's value and time itself. So in order to reason about the value, you have to know where it is in the code because it obviously can change at any point. Whereas if it's immutable, then there's only one point that defines its value. And you can reason about that same value for the rest of the code base without considering any other line of code. So I actually find it's, it's a subtle, but really, really important one. Psychomatic complexity, got it in the name. Uh, we're just talking about branches, really. Leaky abstractions is the other interesting one. And I go into this uh, in a bit more depth in my talk on simplicity, but abstractions are one of our biggest weapons in the fight against complexity. But a leaky abstraction, and I make a case in the talk for every abstraction being leaky, but a leaky abstraction actually complicates the abstraction itself with the thing it's abstracting. We've now got to deal with two things. So it actually increases the complexity, just a case of how much. So go into some ways to, to work around that in the talk and, and how to minimize it. But uh, if you've ever found yourself debugging some code and then having to switch mindset as you drop through levels of abstraction, you, you know what I'm talking about here. And then any sorts of dependencies in your code are, well, that they're always going to increase the complexity, whether that's code dependencies or module dependencies. Again, it's another talk on how to deal with that, but these are things to watch for. So my formula for lowering complexity. Well, before I get to that, the result you'll get from lowering the complexity, increasing the simplicity is, well, first of all, it's easier to test. This is usually where I start from when I'm talking about testing, lowering the complexity to make things easier to test. But it also means that it's easier to reason about. Oops, because like a, uh, as I mentioned with the, the example of mutability, you don't have to look in one place to, to know how something is for the rest of your code most of the time. And that makes it easier to change as well because you know what the impact is going to be. So this is my formula. Test-driven development plus functional programming are, I find, the two main tools for dealing with complexity and, and keeping it low. If you keep in mind that complexity is the enemy, or unnecessary complexity is the enemy. How does TDD help? What TDD does, it doesn't automatically make your code less complex, but it tells you straight away when any of those problems on the previous slide actually are affecting your code, because it's going to be harder to test. So. It's the flip side of lowering complexity being easier to test. Well, higher complexity makes it harder to test, of course. So that's the signal. And then you can use the functional programming techniques to, to reduce that complexity. That's a very brief summary, summary of what I've done a whole talk on. There will be links to all of these talks, by the way, uh, and other material. Uh, I'll give you a single link at the end. It will take you to a page with them all there. So uh, you don't need to try and make notes here. I will move on. Just check if there's any other questions. I don't see any there. So unless anyone has any now. Yeah. Okay, then let's efficiently move on to talk about efficiency again and reasonability again. But this time, the intersection between these two. Now, this is where we, we often see the, the classic trade-off. Do you make your code easy to read? or do you want it to perform well? Pick one, is what we usually think. Well, let's think for a moment why that is actually the case in the first place. So we have our low level machines uh, and we have high level code that gives us more abstractions and 
more ability to express, express things closer to the problem domain. And there's a bit of a disconnect between the two. And, and that's where loss of efficiency comes from. So we invented this thing called systems languages. Well, we sort of started there, really. C++ is a systems language. And there's a problem here in that the, the low-level machine that these systems language languages were really modeling was originally the PDP-11. Forever we'll trace it back to two. You've probably heard this story before, but the PDP-11, if you, if you never see one, this is what they look like. Well, this is along with a load of peripherals, basically fills a room. Things have moved on a little bit since then, not just, not just in terms of what they look like, but although Intel's architecture actually traces its lineage back to at least being inspired by the PDP-11, in terms of what makes for efficient and optimal code, that's where all the changes have gone. Optimizing for PDP-11 architecture will not work on, on modern architectures. So I'm probably not telling you anything you don't know, but just to sketch in the context here. Trying to optimize down to the metal in code is a very different proposition to what it used to be. So it actually flips things around so that often, not always, but often, more often than we may realize, optimizing for reasonability, so not just readability, but reasonability, when we also link that to simplicity, actually gives the compiler more scope to optimize for you. It's going to do a better job most of the time. So it actually flips the whole thing around. And often, there's not a conflict, not a trade-off, but rather these things work together. Let's say, not always, that's the important caveat. But let's have a look at an example. And this is actually taken from my uh, functional C++ talk. So this is actually a, uh, what I used to, to talk about reasonability. So very simple, apparently, bit of code, where we want to set our color variable depending on the result of calling some function. Fine. But there's a, quite a few problems just hiding in this very small piece of code. Because we are calling a function, and we're in an if statement, it's a statement. So in order to assign our uh, color value, we need to use assignment instead of initialization which means we have to use a side effect, which is the assignment itself, which means that our color variable can't be mutable, so it has to be mutable. And we have to start it off in an uninitialized state. Quite a few problems with such a small piece of code. Now we could, of course, in this case, use a ternary operator. Now we're initializing all in a single expression. This is what we want. So we can make it const, there's no side effects. And as a bonus, we can use type inference as well, because that's all known at the same point. Of course, that doesn't scale. Even just with the two cases, that can get quite messy. But once you've got more, more things you're dealing with, uh, like uh, free states here, you can't use a ternary operator anymore. Well, not in any sort of reasonable way. So we sort of fall back to this more imperative style with the uninitialized variable. Uh, but there is a, a way to fool C++ into thinking it's an expression-oriented language, and that's to use an immediately invoked Lambda expression. Now, when I first mentioned this in my functional C++ talk a few years ago, this was still a fairly new idea in the C++ community. Uh, I think most people are fairly familiar with it now, so I won't dwell on it too much. But Basically, we get back all of the, the benefits of what we have with the ternary operator. Although we, we do still have a return statement in there, what we, we can make a variable const, we can make it auto, no side effects, at least none that are visible. Uh, so that, that, that's great. But we're talking about efficiency as well. Does this introduce any extra overhead? Well, in this case, because it's an enum, or presumably an enum, fairly easy to see that um, it's probably going to compile down to uh, at least as optimal code. Probably not any more optimal, though. In fact, I think I did at the time, we, we didn't actually have Compiler Explorer when I first um, 
wrote this example that came out just after. Well, I did decompile two versions and, and show that they were identical code. But if we have something a little bit more complex, so we have some sort of expensive type, they're expensive to, to initialize, expensive to copy. This is obviously a, just a stand in for that. And we, we now use that. We may actually find that using the immediately invoked Lambda expression to the so-called simpler way is also more performant. And I'm actually now going to demonstrate that by, I just switch my screen share. Hopefully that's now shown my whole window. I've actually got this up in Compiler Explorer. So here's our expensive type. Uh, here's our switch statement. So this is the one that has the um, default initialized version. Still see the slides? Oh no. Okay, let me uh, switch that again. It didn't. Uh... Oh, okay. Okay, good. Yeah, I'm not used to using Skype for this. All right. So here we have our expensive type. And, and here we have our switch statement that's using the uninitialized variable and then assignment. And on the, the right hand side, uh, I had to make the, the font a bit bigger so it's a bit harder to read. Same expensive type, but we're using the immediately invoked Lambda expression. Now we can, of course, just look at the assembler in, in uh, Compiler Explorer, but it's, it's a bit hard to compare. So what I did, and I might need to reshare this again if it didn't catch up. Let me just do that. I just did a diff of the two. So the first part, as you expect, there's no real differences. These are just labels. That's just the uh, initial part. Now we get down to the part in uh, main where it's, um, it's actually, first of all, initializing the object and then doing the assignment. And you can see on the, the left-hand side is the mutable version. Uh, it's doing a lot more work. And if you, if you have a look, you can see that is actual real work that is gonna take more time. So quite convincing argument for the simpler code being more performant, at least in this case. So let me uh, try to switch back efficiently to my slides. Okay, hopefully you are seeing the slides again. Before we leave this topic of the intersection between reasonability and efficiency, I want to talk a little bit more about testing again, and in fact, specifically property-based testing again. I talked about that earlier in the context of uh, increasing coverage and uh, reliability, but I have something to say here as well, because sometimes you may have a um, an algorithm, let's say. It doesn't have to be an algorithm, but we use the example of an algorithm where you can either write a, a slow but easy to understand version. This is where the reasonability comes in. But there's also a fast but really tricky to get correct version that you could write, an optimized version. Now, if, you, if these two things should produce exactly the same output for exactly the same inputs, you could use a property-based testing framework in this case, I'm actually using uh, Catch2, which has partial support with, uh, with generators. What you can use the, the slow but easy version to test the, the fast but tricky version. And, and I have used this technique before to, to verify something that's very difficult to verify uh, by hand, but uh, it's, it's trivial to verify that the simple version. This is another way that you can actually intersect reasonability and efficiency, but which you may not have thought of. So that concludes that section. Do we have any questions about efficiency and reasonability? No. Everyone's still talking about Mr. Crap. Yeah, so yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, um, we're actually coming to, to round out the material because we've actually looked at um, several intersections at this point. 
And you'll see that uh, some of them, well, we, you know, we've got correctness comes up a couple of times, reliability and so on. In fact, you can, we can join these up and there we go. We can pretty much link them all up. Uh, if, if we just drop that link between reliability and reasonability for the sake of the, uh, the chart, we get a nice, uh, nice chain there. What is these intersections we talked about? There's others we could have talked about, but um, that's a good image to finish on. What we've talked about is broadly three things that have an impact on these. Uh, and these are uh, three of the themes from my um, talks that I started this, this whole talk talking about. Uh, so using the type system, and uh, particularly in combination with uh, functional techniques, Having a good understanding of error handling and the different types of error handling, and using tests, whether that's um, TDD as an approach, uh, using property based testing and other forms of testing. Between those three sort of broad areas, we get pretty good coverage on, on all of those software qualities. There's only a dotted line to the applicability because that's generally outside the scope of what you can automate. But there's another thing that I haven't really talked about except very briefly my introduction, and that is that static and dynamic analysis also help us with all of those qualities except for, again, the applicability. So I think you really need both sides. You need the, the tests, the, the types, and the, uh, the error handling, but back that up with static and dynamic analysis to catch all the things that, uh, that you didn't catch yourself. Before we do finish, I have one more thing to talk about. And that is based on this blog from a few years ago by Michael Feathers. Don't be put off by the title, The Flawed Theory Behind Unit Testing. He's not saying that unit testing is flawed. Uh, really fascinating uh, post. I um, encourage you to read it. The, the meat of this post is not what we want to talk about here. There's just a, a quote near the end I want to draw your attention to because you, you can see how this links in. It says, in the software industry, we've been chasing quality for years. The interesting thing is there are a number of things that work. Design by contract works. Test-driven development works. So do clean room, code inspections, and the use of high-level languages. It's almost like you read the abstract for this talk. So yeah, all of these things help us to improve software quality. All, yeah, all these techniques have been shown to increase quality. And if we look closely, we can see why. All of them force us to reflect on our code. So according to Michael Feathers, it's the reflecting on the code that's really the important thing. And all of the things we talked about also help us to reflect on our code. So as we look at our stack of uh, six software qualities, we can actually tie this all back to Zen because the original definition of Zen is meditation. And if you look on the Wikipedia page for meditation, it says that it's a practice where an individual uses techniques such as mindfulness or focusing the mind on a particular object, thought or activity or code to train attention and awareness and achieve a mentally clear and stable state. So that ties in really well, I think, with what Michael Feathers was saying about focusing on the code. So maybe Zen does actually come into this after all. And that has been Zen and the Art of Code Lifecycle Maintenance. Do we have any, um, any final questions before we wrap up? Oh, uh, I should just point out, we've got that URL there for all the references, links, and things to, to other talks and material on my website um, on, the, on the page there. So questions? So first of all, thanks a lot. I definitely loved the last remark, um, the, the connection to Zen. This was a very, very nice roundup. Perfect. We do have a question from Catherine. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure if th that there's an easy answer to that. But she's asking, do you have any suggestion on how to make managers slash customers watch your talk other than at gunpoint? Uh, you, could, you could use knife point um, or any other sort of weapon 
um, or just uh, put it on when they're not not paying attention. No, I don't. Um, just get them to watch all the other talks I referenced instead, and you'll you'll get the same conclusion, I think. But good idea to get them to watch it. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Any other questions? So of course there is a, a small time delay, um, which means if yeah. I ask if there's questions, then people will have to. So then this airs only approximately ten seconds later. Um, yep. What you need to do is just waffle for ten seconds and give them a chance to. <laughs> no, I, I definitely love to talk. I admit I've seen it before, but um, interestingly, watching it a second time it actually doesn't hurt. Actually, I, I got a couple of new details. Um, it it truly is a very very nice talk. <laughs> Thank okay. you. All right. So yeah. I will be around in the, the exactly. Zoom afterwards so we can we can talk about so, um, it. Thank me, you for having me. Let me post the Zoom link to um, yeah, anyone who wants to join us. So I just posted the Zoom link. So you all of you are very welcome to join us in this after talk chat. This is your opportunity to ask uh, Phil, to ask uh, Timur questions in person, and of course to, to meet other C enthusiasts. So thanks a lot for attending and thanks again to both Timur and Phil for these two great talks. Okay, see you next Thank time. Thank you very much, Klaus, for hosting. Yeah. And uh, have a great rest of the evening.